The generation that grew up with nuclear weapons were told to hide under their desks in case of attack. This generation faces an even greater threat, the climate crisis. And again, they have nowhere to hide. While citizens, cities and countries are working to reduce their emissions, behind our backs, the coal, oil and gas industry continues to rapidly expand fossil fuels, driving catastrophic warming. Surviving the climate crisis requires a bold new idea. Introducing the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Why a treaty? 50 years ago, the world signed a non-proliferation treaty to avoid nuclear war. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol protected the ozone. The Paris Agreement begins to limit emissions, but doesn't mention coal, oil or gas. We need a global plan to end the proliferation of fossil fuels and fast-track solutions. A fossil fuel treaty would phase out coal, oil and gas faster, more fairly and forever, while supporting workers, communities and countries dependent on fossil fuels. People around the world are already winning frontline battles against coal, oil and gas projects. A treaty can bring together these diverse efforts into a powerful and equitable global plan. Endorse the Fossil Fuel Treaty and together we can drive a just transition to clean energy and a safe climate for generations to come. Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I think that video did an excellent job in, in kicking us off this morning. So I'm actually just going to jump straight into discussion and we'll be coming to questions later. So do keep those in mind. Um, Zipporah, I want to start with you and ask, how did we get here? How did you get here? And how did this treaty idea even come about? Well, for me, this... Um this journey really started about, I guess, 15 years ago, at least over a decade ago. Um, my, I live in Canada, and and our our, our government um, under the previous prime minister, Prime Minister Harper, had declared that Canada was going to become an energy superpower. In fact, in a speech here in the UK, I just remember that. Um, and and Canada was going to become an energy superpower by tripling the size of the tar sands, um, the oil sands in Canada. It's one of the um, most carbon intensive uh, forms of oil development in the world. In order to do that, the industry proposed five pipelines across uh, North America, many of which transversed thousands of streams, etc. So, you know, frontline communities, indigenous leaders, uh, people started rising up and doing all of these protests. And, you know, you'll, you'll, you can remember the um, the Keystone Pipeline campaign, the Gateway campaign, all of these pipeline campaigns, and people started rising up and protesting and, and trying to, to block these projects. And it, what I realized at the time was that all these people are saying keep it in the ground, and in fact, around 2014, the science started supporting that with this amazing paper by Christoph McGlade and Paul Eakins saying most of the oil has to remain in the ground. But it was like on the inside, governments couldn't hear us because they had no policy pathway for that to make sense for them. And so at the time, I kind of thought, well, we're not making progress because we have this government that just didn't believe in climate change, ridiculed uh, climate change. And then we elected a, a more progressive government, believed in climate change. Many of you will remember Prime Minister Trudeau standing at the, in the Paris uh, uh, Agreement with his hand on his heart saying, Canada's back. <laughs> And, and it, for a lot of us, that was really exciting. And a lot of my friends went into government, you know, working on the climate policy. And in fact, they put in place some pretty good climate policy, carbon tax, demand reduction, vehicle efficiency, etc. cetera. And the, not only the oil sands continued to grow, but so did fracking in the country. And, and I was appointed at the time by the Alberta government um, to be the chair of the oil sands advisory working group with the former CEO of Shell to, to help design climate policy in the oil sands. And what I realized is although we, we could reach some agreement with industry on price, et cetera, that, that there was no willingness to constrain at all production. 
and and the, and no framework for that, and. And I, and I got really disheartened and I started looking around the world and trying to understand, it. are other jurisdictions going through this? And organized meetings with other advocates and academics from Norway, from Argentina, from uh, in the Amazon, and everyone I talked to was having the same problem here in the UK. And, and there really wasn't a framework. And so I can, I'll never forget the day I, I, I sat with the Paris Agreement and said, okay, so what are the mechanisms to constrain the production of fossil fuels? And I searched the Paris Agreement for the words oil, gas, coal, fossil fuels, and they didn't exist. And it was that moment for me when I realized that for 30 years, we've been designing policy to reduce demand while production has been continuing to grow and lock in future emissions. And we really didn't have a framework at a national level for policy, and definitely not at an international level. And every country, like Canada or the UK, they all want to be the last barrel sold. And, and so we needed international cooperation. So I, around that time, Peter Newell and Andrew Sims, academics, again, from here in the UK, um, published the first paper on the fossil fuel, the idea of a fossil fuel treaty, building off the um, fossil fuel treaty that was proposed early in 2015 by Pacific Island nations, the Suva Declaration. And, and I just cold called them and I said, I've been thinking about the same thing, can we meet up? And I created a little steering committee and we started talking and meeting with other lawyers and diplomats around the world. And, and then in, uh, a couple of years later, I won this award, this Climate Breakthrough Award, where they give you $2 million to, to try and do bold climate strategies, um, no pressure, <laughs> like, um, to, to start something new and try something different. And so I, I created the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative, uh, and uh, that was uh, three years ago, and we went live as an idea 24 months ago. Incredible. And, and before I kind of come to the other panelists, I just want to ask one other question for people who are maybe less familiar with the treaty. What are some of the central pillars of, of that treaty for us to really understand how it works? We actually designed, um, we don't have a written treaty. That's really important to understand because most of the diplomats and lawyers that I've talked to have said, look, you, you have to first create a push for a treaty. And if you look in history, landmines, nuclear weapons, that's really important. And then, and then countries themselves have to come together and start drafting it or they won't own it. So what we've done is we've worked with um, uh, various uh, academics and lawyers from around the world to create the principles of the treaty. So, so it's designed roughly on nuclear non-proliferation, the same pillars. The first pillar is, first of all, stop expansion. It, it's not a transition if we're growing the problem. So the first pillar will, is principles around how do we stop expansion? How do we overcome the barriers, especially in the global south, of countries who are now expanding fossil fuels, how do we support them to stop expansion? And the, one of the principles, of course, under that is that the, the wealthy countries have to stop first. And then there is the second pillar, which is managing a global just transition. So who gets to produce and how much in a world when we know we have a defined carbon budget? Right now, the markets get to decide that, or OPEC. There's not a lot of justice or fairness built into that system. And, and so the second pillar is about how do we manage that? And we've commissioned a number of reports now looking at the principles of equity and fairness and how that would be applied to a managed and orderly transition of production and emissions. And then the third pillar is how do you then fast track uh, the solutions that are necessary in order to not just change our energy systems, but to replace the economic revenue, especially for many countries, the export revenue that they rely on from the production of, of fossil fuels. And so we now have research and development going on underneath each of the pillars of the treaty. That's great, and I think that gives us a really good foundation to kind of all be on the same page. And Brian, I, I wanna to come to you and, and ask you, specifically in the UK, what is the importance of a treaty like this? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm uh, Barney Wendt and I've been involved in UK climate action for a number of decades and I was involved in the UK's Climate Change Act. I helped write it in 2008 when it was uh, passed into law. And um, the reason why we need supranational or international frameworks on the supply side of fossil fuels is because although it's great that nations are taking action and we are setting net zero targets and reducing carbon budgets and taking action to get ourselves off fossil fuels, it's too slow. And it also only attacks the problem from one side. So if you think about how you want to have an orderly transition into clean, you, the most orderly way would be to cut with both sides. Two blades are better than one in terms of, of, of making an orderly transition. So a scissor is more effective than a knife. And that means attacking the supply side 
and the demand side. So though we are phasing out ICE vehicles and doing what we can with uh, changing our power systems over, and the UK is leading the world in some of that, we're still about to license a whole bunch of new uh, fracking wells, according to the Tories, though I don't think that'll happen, or uh, more off offshore oil and gas installations, when really that's a very old and mature field. We should be really now just moving away from that and focusing on offshore wind. But the pressure on governments and on politicians is from the incumbents and from those who've made money and amassed a huge amount of political power and will over the last century, saying to governments, well, you know, you need us. Uh, we're your friends. We, we pay taxes. We employ people. You need to keep us in business. And that myth, which is entirely a myth now, because actually, relative to other parts of the economy, they're tiny. And most of their wealth disappears off in shareholder value that we don't see. It doesn't trickle down at all. So they're, and we're actually paying them now to decommission these wells. So even on a tax basis, it's not clear that they're our friends at all. So that has all changed, but the politics hasn't. They still know the right people. They employ the right PR and public affairs agencies, and they get involved. And they write policy. They write tax policy. They write laws. And they lobby them through. And that, is, that makes a country very vulnerable. And what we need is an international framework, which make, makes this problem much more tractable for individual countries. We can't solve it on our own. And we need a framework that's fair, and we need a framework that starts with those rich countries who've got rich on the back of these weapons of mass destruction taking action first. And that's why a treaty is the, really one of the only ways I can see that we can get out of this problem. And you touched on some of the economics and the business. So, Paul, I, I want to come to you and ask you a little bit about the economic and business impl implications of a treaty like this. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm Paul Mason. I write for the New Statesman and New European. Um, and I'm also a politically active journalist in the Labour Party. Um, so um, people like me have, for more than 20 years, been arguing that there is no market solution to climate change. Um, we've seen some quite powerful insiders adopt that view over the last 10 years. Um, and I think it is proven that it's, it's too slow. It only acts, it only acts on one, one side of the equation, as you've just described. Um, but being proven right isn't necessarily a good idea if you can't do anything about it. At the time we were arguing, you know, Kyoto, etc., even Paris is not enough. At least the kind of pushback against us was, well, you know, globalization and markets are the way the world works. Um, and we were seeing deepening globalization, greater marketization, even place like China. Um, no, that's not the case. We're, since the middle of the last decade, we've been in a process of deglobalization. And if you look at your own country, and it's not unique, uh, the state controls the energy market. The state is paying half of people's energy bills. The state just underwrote the entire retail uh, gas and electricity system with a state subsidy. And so the state, i.e. we the people, through our governments, are the actor. In the, energy, in the global energy market. So it, it is ridiculous to say, well, you know, the market um, will sort it out. All the decisions are being taken by states. And here's the thing. Quite correctly, those states have to embody an answer to the trilemma, to, to security of supply, to affordability, and to environmental sustainability. Every single one of those criteria no points to decarbonisation. And why, but, and yet why, as you say, Bryony, why is it so hard for us and so easy for the fossil fuel incumbents? Because it's not just that they're, the business models and the transmission me mechanisms are ingrained. It's the way of thinking, carbon way of thinking. We read Andreas Malm's book. The carbon way of thinking is deeply ingrained in, into capitalism. And we're going to have to, to do something quite big and, and bold and decisive to, to, to move people's minds away from the carbon way of thinking and the carbon structures. So we've touched a bit on, um, each of you touched a little bit on, on politics and the political challenges, and I want to zoom in on that and talk about maybe what are some of the, the, really, the really big things in, in the kind of international political sphere right now that are standing in the way, and I think obviously one of the areas to talk about is, is Ukraine. And I want to come to you and ask you, like, from, from your perspective, what are those challenges? Okay, I think that one of the things has, that's become clear uh, with Putin's war on Ukraine is how vulnerable uh, the, the fossil fuel system is to, 
to dictatorships, to choke points. I mean, we just look at Nord Stream uh, and, and, and what happened this week. And, and what, I, what I think is really disgusting is that, you know, the, bo the first bombs hadn't even fallen in the Ukraine before the fossil fuel industry was using the moment to get out there and push for more fossil fuel infrastructure. And it, it, it makes no sense whatsoever to double down on the conditions that have created this crisis with the companies themselves who have created these crises and this vulnerability. And, and a lot of the infrastructure and the new fossil fuel development that they're proposing, especially you know, the new gas infrastructure across Africa, et cetera, it will take too long and it will be too expensive to deal with the short term uh, energy security and crisis situation. If we want security in terms of a stable climate, our health, and in terms of our energy systems, then we need to be moving towards renewable energy and electrification and decarbonization. And, and the, the facts are clear on that, but what we're seeing is an incredible, incredibly funded, well-funded fossil fuel industry push against that. And one of the things that was so incredible for us is at the Fossil Fuel Treaty is less than a month after um, uh, the war started, uh, organizations across the Ukraine uh, contacted us and some of those Zoom calls, some of those people were sitting in their basements, you know, and, and they had just done community meetings on how to make Molotov cocktails. I mean, these are academics and advocates and scientists. And they started organizing uh, around uh, the Ukraine. Um, and they actually produced a, a really short video, which I think we, we, we have uh, here. It's only 60 seconds, but it's worth um, uh, taking a look at if, if we can at some point. And we're very lucky, actually, in the room, um, we have uh, one of the women who's been running the campaign in the Ukraine. So when we get to the q and I'd like to yeah, ask you to absolutely. say a few words. Should we leave the video yeah. to the Q&A, or yeah. should we do that now? Uh, yeah, let's do it now. Why not? We'll be in the way. We'll be in the way. It's a bit weird. Okay, we'll do it afterwards. That's fine. Yeah, we'll do it right we'll right um, uh, But I want to pick up on this point you made around um, the narrative, right? The narrative around, we need more. We need to double down. Well, you touched on this a little bit as well. Do you think that the fossil fuel industry has done really well on capturing the narrative at the moment, and how do we bring it back? Can you start in? Well, um, yeah, they kind of have, but another part of the narrative slipped away from them. Uh, everybody now knows that, that renewable energy would be cheaper, would be more secure in the UK context because we've got plenty of wind, we've got a bit of sun, and, and we can build nuclear. Um, and... And here's the thing. I think the way the Ukraine situation has, has affected this is that people can also see that Putin launched this war because the, a, a fossil oligarch model of economics no longer applies in the back half of this century. There won't be that kind of rentier-seeking power. And so he has to do it now. His, his weapon is gas, so people can see gas now as a, as, as a, a weapon turned against us. And... I think that, in other words, the security of supply plus affordability can now, what, does it, what do we have to combine it with? And I think this is the thing that is my obsession. We need to move the, 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 the debate about sustainability away from virtue towards self-interest. And it's quite hard for those of us who try to think virtuously about fossil fuels. But, but what politics is, the, 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 the politics in the UK is winning the argument for renewables by showing that it's in your self-interest as a community and as a nation to go for them. Yeah, and, and what's true of the UK is true globally, right? That there are only several countries that have got huge reserves of fossil fuels and the capacity to export them. And the rest of us are all drug takers, they're the drug pushers and we're the dependents on their product. But when you move into a clean energy system, that goes away. It's hugely democratizing to shift to a renewable and nuclear future, which is clean, because you can put this stuff anywhere and it's not dependent on the, the accident of geology. And there are geological elements, like the UK happens to be the Saudi Arabia of, of wind because of where we are, and that's great. But, but the sun shines you know, on a large tract of the world. Mm. And, there, and, if you, and we happen to agree on nuclear, many of you may not, but that's also incredibly uh, able to be controlled by a country. So 
You can move away from these volatile but highly concentrated control substances that we're all hooked on, and it's already happening. I mean, that's what's, that's what's giving me hope, is that mm. these things are cheaper, people understand the benefits for health and for security as much as they do climate. So it's happening. But that's causing a reaction from the fossil industry. They're not just going, oh, okay, we'll go into the night gently then. You know, they're fighting back. And they have frontiers all over the planet where they can go and try and find more of this resource and bring it to market. The tar sands, actually, that Zap started with, that's a classic example of a crazy thing that should never have been brought to market. But it did, because there are powerful interests who know they can make profit because we're all hooked on this product. But we can wake up and stop being hooked. And we need an orderly way of doing that. And I think that's why a treaty, a global treaty, is the answer. Because it gives, forces this conversation, accepts that we're addicted, and works out a plan to get us off this stuff in an orderly way. Disorderly way will cause price spikes and price dips and chaos and job losses and, 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 and you know people may die in a cold winter. We don't want that. We want an orderly transition. We want a reverse OPEC that basically takes control of this situation. This is, um, I think, a very interesting point to just dwell on for a second, which is this idea of doing this in a way that's just and equitable. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what that could look like. Uh, in the UK, what that could look like globally, not the same solutions that might work in the global north will work in the, in the global south. And so how do you think that um, moving away from fossil fuels can be done in a way that's, that's just and equitable? Well, first of all, we have to stop giving taxpayers money to the oil and gas companies who are recording some of the, the you know, literally record, record profits in, in human history. The IMF reported last year that we're currently giving the fossil fuel industry $11 million a minute in, in taxpayers' money globally. And then just two weeks ago, the... Uh, we'll come, we will definitely come to Q&A. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So $11 million a minute. And, and, and then last two weeks ago, the IA and the OECD put out a report saying that, and fossil fuel uh, subsidies have increased in the last year by 51%. So this is the last gasp of the fossil fuel industry. And they're using their political power in order to push our governments to help them lock in more infrastructure. And so that's, that's in part what's distorting the markets. So renewables are cheaper, um, uh, demand is going down, and the fact is that we are on track now to produce 110% more oil and gas projects between now and 2030 than can ever be burned under a 1.5 degree scenario. And in fact, the top 20 oil and gas companies have 930 billion in new projects between now and 2030. So, so we're actually on the completely wrong trajectory, and, in, and we're doing it with taxpayers' dollars. And, and I think that this new carbon take-back proposal as well, and, and this idea that we somehow have to pay the companies to do carbon capture and storage that they've been promising for 10 years and failing to deliver, again, is absurd because we know that, that renewable energy technology and the infrastructure that we need is going to require taxpayer money because it, we're gonna, it's gonna require upgrade, upgrading our grids and putting in place cleaner and safer infrastructure and all of our money should be going to that now. I completely forgot your original question. I was so- <laughs> That's fine. Well, I, I, really, I really like this answer, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy. Uh, but you touched on it a bit because if, it, which was about just transition. Like if taxpayer money is going to the fossil fuel companies, it's not going elsewhere. Right, so, so what the treaty proposes is that, is that we, we shift that money uh, to cleaner, safer infrastructure at home, to fairness and equitable, a fair and equitable managed and orderly decline, as you've said. But that also we create a new fund, a global just transition fund. And this is not just about reparations and loss and damage. This is about the fact that you have countries right now like Ecuador doing new, dr new oil drilling in the heart of the Amazon just to feed their debt. So how crazy is that? We know we need the Amazon in order to have global biodiversity and climate resiliency, and yet we're doing new oil drilling there just to feed their debt, and a number of countries are in that position. So we're going to have to create new international cooperation in order to have a global just transition, because many countries in the global south cannot ensure a just transition, and in fact are going in the opposite direction, and, and they're going to need support to make that happen.
So, just, Bryony, a question for you. If we're thinking about the UK context again, what does that l just transition look like for people who maybe work in these industries or, or even just communities around the world that might be dependent? Uh, well, I mean, it, it's, it, we've, we've, we're well on our way to a transition in the UK, and it, some of it's been orderly and some of it's been disorderly. And uh, the, the most disorderly was when we came off coal uh, in the 70s because we discovered North Sea gas and... Uh, we weren't uh, building, you know, we basically decimated the coal uh, communities. And it was done under a government that didn't really care, and therefore it wasn't handled very well. We have left behind communities still today from that transition. Um, so we have to learn from history and, and work out you know, how we do it differently. I would say, though, that the oil and gas transition is not the same as a coal transition. This is a highly profitable industry. Very few people work in it. It's offshore. It's peripatetic in that it moves wherever the oil is, really. But it may take it decades to move, but it's not the same uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in that sense. There are parts of the country which will depend on that, those petrodollars flowing, trickling down, uh, to coin a phrase. <laughs> but, but really, it's not this, in any way the same. There's fewer jobs. It's not as enmeshed in a community. And we shouldn't fall for this you know, myth that somehow the oil and gas workers are really underpaid, poor people. They're not. They earn huge amounts of money. And they're in a very profitable industry. So actually, you know, where's the just transition for supermarket cashiers? <laughs> who actually do need a just transition as we replace them with robots. You know, we, we can get caught up, I think, to, in trying to solve for too many objectives. And the clarity we need is that there will be growth into new jobs. And those jobs will involve engineering skills and the same sorts of training that people have had in the oil and gas industry will be switched over, in fact, have been switched over into developing offshore wind. The reason we're leaders in offshore wind is because we've got fantastic engineers who know how to build large amounts of metal out at sea and to service those and they have the vessels and, and it, all of these jobs that come from that. So I think the UK has learned, is doing it a little bit better. And actually now really what we need to focus on is, is making people's homes affordable to heat. And that's the crisis of this winter is going to be, can people pay enough to keep their houses warm and how do we help them insulate, get more clear, get, get clearer about how they can heat their homes safely. And that's the social justice element we really should be focused on right now and we need a government that puts that as a priority and sadly at the moment there's not much sign of it. But let's, who knows, you know, and we can do things ourselves, let's be honest. Communities are helping each other out. You know, if you find a great person who can log it, lag your loft, tell your neighbours about it and get them all done at the same time. You know, we're not hopeless. We don't have to wait for the state to do everything. These things are purchasable. The payback periods are short. We should be educating ourselves. I'm worried about the the ease with which the words "just transition" uh, come to our conversation. I want a just transition, both socially in this country and globally. Um, but, you know, I fear that there will, we'll come to a moment and where the opponents of the transition, who are currently you know, the, kind of, the kind of fossil fuel funded politicians, the right wing, generally right wing, but there are some, you know, kind of productivist left, will suddenly realise that, my goodness, this has to happen very, very fast. And, you know, the Second World War wasn't the, a just a defeat of Nazism. Terrible injustices took place during the victory of the Allies and Soviet Union. And so it's quite easy that people who are now saying, yeah, leave it all to the Kyoto or leave it all to Paris, will say, shit, we need, a, we need an unjust transition. That's my, that's my big concern. And so why law, why treaty matters? We're going to come to talk, I think, about indigenous people. But, you know, the Torres Strait Islanders who just won this amazing case against the Australian government, they need law um, to ensure justice. And if they need it on the edge of a very fragile ecosystem, so the people in my hometown, Lee. You know, my, if, you, if, if you ever go through Lancashire, um, the only still standing pit headgear, the winding gear, Astley Green Colliery, is just outside the town I come from. My granddad went down there in 1914. My dad went down there in 1945. But I'll tell you this about both of them. Though they loved them, the life they lived in that mining community and are really, were really upset, rather, that it was destroyed, they loved the earth more. They loved nature more than work. And I think we can win those communities over, not if we can actually show them that there is a law they can appeal to, just like the, the Torres Strait Islanders did. So that, for me, is what arms people like me who have to work inside a labour and trade union movement that isn't completely bought in. 
to the transition, just or otherwise, because they don't believe it will be just. Excellent, excellent point. I want to, as Bronny mentioned, it's been 24 months for, since the launch of, of the treaty. I want to ask you the, how the momentum has built and some key milestones that you could share with us along that journey and where you are now. It's it's really been an an incredible ride. I we we started focusing on first building uh, the conversation uh, with the scientists, academics, lawyers, diplomats, Nobel laureates. I mean, partly we in the first year we were like, is this a good idea? Will it fly? Um, within uh, I think three months of launching, we had a hundred and one Nobel laureates who had endorsed the concept, including the Dalai Lama. Um, and then we, we started uh, convening and talking to scientists and academics around the world. Um, so I think so far 3,000 uh, scientists and academics have endorsed the fossil fuel treaty. You know, these are all people who are saying no new projects, not in the UK, not in Canada, nowhere in the world, no fossil fuel expansion, and let's manage the wind down. It, it's actually uh, flipping, uh, you know, the social norm around expansion being essential for prosperity, etc. Really fast. It's much faster than we thought it, it could happen. So, so it was Nobel laureates. Then it was scientists, and then cities. Vancouver um, came to me and said, "It's my hometown." And they said, we love what you're doing with this fossil fuel treaty. And, and with nuclear nonproliferation, cities were critical in calling on their, their governments and creating more citizen engagement around the idea. Like, I'm old enough to remember nuclear free zone as a sign in front of my city when I was growing up. And they said, so we'd like to pass a motion. Can you help us draft one? So we drafted a motion. Vancouver became the first city in the world to endorse the fossil fuel treaty unanimously. And then all of a sudden we were getting contacted by LA, by Toronto, by, and it just grew really fast. So now we have, I think, 69 cities, including London in July, thanks to the, um, some people here who are doing some incredible organizing. Um, and and uh, the most recent city is Calcutta, the largest, largest city in India. So we have the cities. And then a, a parallel initiative popped forward of parliamentarians from around the world endorsing uh, the three pillars and the concepts. And, and I checked this morning, we now have 500 elected officials from 68 countries, and they have their own initiative and their own website, fossilfreefuture.org, um, and, and that's running. Uh, and, then, uh, and then health organizations started joining up. So we now have 1,700 organizations around the world that have endorsed the treaty, many of whom are starting fossil fuel treaty campaigns, running it themselves. We have open sourced it and said, go with it. And, and so health groups started a sign-on letter um, only a, uh, in June. And in, in July, we were quite astounded, uh, the World Health Organization contacted us. And so now the WHO has endorsed the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is, is quite a, a thing for the WHO to do. And then, um, uh, and then the Vatican endorsed the Fossil Fuel Treaty in, in July, and faith groups from around the world, many of whom uh, really organized around divestment, are now taking on uh, the Fossil Fuel Treaty. So we have thousands of faith organizations as well. And, and I guess the, the biggest thing was last week. We had our first country uh, propose and call for uh, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty on the floor of the UN General Assembly, and that was Vanuatu. It's quite incredible to see that momentum build and like all of these different areas, this kind of intersectional support. I want to just pick on one to start with, which is the WHO. Why is it so important to have health organizations on board for something like this? Because that seems, I mean, as if you don't know much about climate or you're looking at it for the first time, that doesn't seem like a natural fit. What, why did the WHO make this very bold kind of commitment? Because fossil fuels are now the greatest threat to human health. And, and not just because of climate change. Because the new studies from the last year are showing that one in five premature deaths globally come from air pollution from fossil fuels. One in five. Eight million people a year are dying from fossil fuels just from air pollution, let alone, of course, the extreme weather and the floods and the fires and all, all of the other things. What's really fascinating about our whole conversation about climate change today is that when we talk about the fossil fuel treaty and the, and the threats that fossil fuels pose to health and climate, most people don't realize 
that 86% of the emissions trapped in our atmosphere today come from three things, oil, gas, and coal. And so it's these three products that are the greatest threat to human health, the greatest threat to climate and biodiversity stability globally. And, and so I think it's that human health threat uh, that has really pushed a lot of the, the health organizations to start saying, yeah, the, this is right. We, we can't expand this anymore. This is the biggest threat to human health. I, I think it's also quite interesting that uh, a UN body has uh, done this because I don't know if you've seen Antonio Guterres at the moment. He's turned into a more radical than Greenpeace in terms of his, <laughs> his spoken word. But at the moment, he's still relying really just on UNFCCC, which is the, the body that looks after the Paris Agreement, as his main tool. And I'm sure he's feeling quite frustrated by that. I mean, you've probably all seen the charts of 26 cops uh, tracked against the emissions, and they're nowhere near peaking, right? We're still on an upward trajectory in terms of emissions. So you have to kind of wonder, have we got all the tools we need for this problem? Maybe not. And, you know, it was the Montreal Protocol, actually, that tackled the ozone problem, which was the most successful example. And that was done through control on supply. You know, they, they didn't say, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we all just voluntarily traded some credits to stop using hairspray? And you know, it just, that just wasn't the way we did it. Uh, we got together, we found substitutions, and we made a treaty. And we gave, we gave a concessionary agreement to the developing countries, and we made the rich countries go first. And, and that is a tool that we have in our toolbox. And the UN knows this. And my suspicion is that they are getting frustrated themselves by this idea that we just have one tool that we use when we can use many. And what we're asking for is another tool. Sits alongside the Paris Agreement, provides that clarity, and starts cutting things from the supply side. And I would love, I hope, I'm just hoping that there's somewhere in the UN the conversation is being had about how do we, how do we give this tacit support, if not object, you know, o o overt support. So that's why I'm excited about it. I want to pick up on two last things before we go to questions. Paul, you mentioned earlier the idea of indigenous communities, and I think we were talking about different groups that are kind of coming into the treaty. I'm curious to know, as well from you, the role of indigenous communities and voices in a treaty like this. Um, I think I, we believe uh, that the indigenous voices and knowledge is integral to trying to help design the treaty, first of all. And so we're, uh, we're working in partnership. We've signed a protocol agreement with COICA, the Federation of Indigenous Nations from across the Amazon, from all nine Amazon uh, countries. Gregorio Mirabel sits on our uh, board of directors and also Indigenous Environment Network. Tom Goldtooth is sitting on our board of directors and in Indigenous Climate Action, Ariel Derringer. And, we're starting to work with them to develop uh, uh, conversations and dialogues with indigenous elders and indigenous leadership to, to ensure that, their, that the design of, of the treaty uh, is, recognizes and learns from. Uh, indigenous leadership. Because that's true reconciliation. It's not just about um, uh, supporting what they're doing, which is also, incredi which also incredibly important, right? These are some of the most courageous frontline communities who are opposing uh, new, new fossil fuel development. But it's also about a back and forth process of learning and shifting our laws and agreements so that they, that they reflect um, uh, their knowledge and their perspectives. I feel like Paul, you might yeah, have something I, Yeah, say. I mean, I, I've just got in front of me, going back to the Torres Strait Island decision, because um, this was a UN, you know, a UN tribunal that said Australia has to, uh, has to fight climate change because it's affecting this indigenous community that lives off northern, islands of northern Australia. And it's only two weeks ago that they won. And these are the words of one of, a, one of them, uh, Nazareth Fawid, who's one of the eight claimants. This is a happy moment for me. I can feel the heartbeat of my people from the past to the present to the future. Our stories are echoing across the world. Those communities, whether it be there, whether it be in the Amazon, whether it be in the island, island states of, uh, of the Indian Ocean, are our nearest, are our nearest indicator as a, as a human species or the most acute indicator of what is wrong, in the sense that, and I think this is something, something that you can translate to anybody who lives in an industrial society. We know how, how divorced our experience is from 
the fragility of nature. Everything around us that got you here up, up into this building is an old piece of infrastructure that is there to protect and give security to human beings. And those people we're talking about there are on the edge of those security uh, mechanisms and networks. And I think that it's, in other words, we can learn from them actually how to effectively fight for the justice and fight for the law because they've got nothing else. Um, they, have no, they have very little social capital, very little power uh, inside the communities they're in. And you know, if the Brazilian election goes the wrong way, they'll have even less power. But that's what I think the point is. They learn how to fight from them. And, and, and I, you know, what's interesting, though, is that we're more in touch with those stories now than we've ever been, because we have built, we haven't just built steel girders, <laughs> we've built a madly interconnected communication system, mm. right, where mm. the internet spreads news and stories so quickly now that um, th the momentum that Zap was talking about is enabled by the, you know, we haven't spent the last 20 years doing nothing, we've created this crazy system that allows us to talk to each other and, and organise and that's what gives me hope, actually, yeah. is that those people who are at the fringes are actually being reached and we're, being, we're hearing from mm. them and working with mm. them and they're being connected in a way that I don't think the tech titans of Silicon Valley really <laughs> imagined. Um, <laughs> and, but I'm really pleased because, it, you know, these tools are not going to go away, um, but we can use them. And one of the things the treaty does amazingly well is that networking and, and use of technology to make this movement really strong. I think Greta Thunberg started to show mm. how easy it is to get movements going. Mm. And I'm confident that the treaty is building on that and making it even more focused on what we need. I feel like you have a good story I, for us. I really want to do a little, Just one small story. Um, because I, I, as I was thinking about trying to design the treaty, I tried to go to as many places, Norway, the UK, etc., and, and meet with people who were on the forefront of, of trying to stop new fossil fuel expansion. And I was in the Amazon, in the Quechua territory in Sarawaku, and, and one night one of the elders, a shaman, um, said, we need to have tea, I, I would like to talk. And so I'm talking to him through two interpreters because I don't speak Spanish and, and, and he, doesn't, he, he doesn't speak Spanish either. He speaks Quechua, so there's two interpreters. So he, he, he says to me, so they had gotten a laptop <laughs> and, and a, and a Wi-Fi solar system. <clears throat> and, um, and so he, he says to me through these interpreters, so I, I, I've been studying uh, your, your society and I just have a couple questions for you, okay? Um, I, I understand that you define wealth um, by this paper money that you've created. And I just had this, had this moment of like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, you know, I didn't even know how to, and, 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 I, and so I just turned it back and I said, could you, could you share with me how you define wealth? And goes through the interpreters and he comes back and he goes, well, it's, it, it's three things. We define wealth as love community and a living forest that provides us the air we breathe and the water we drink, the food that we need in our medicines. And it was, it was a really profound moment for me around, you know, obviously just I'm sitting in the dark in this, you know, hot and then, you know, it was a, it's a very bizarre moment, but it was also just, I, I, I had this, I just made a commitment to myself. I was like, these voices, this knowledge, these frameworks, are actually what the world needs right now to remind us, um, you know, what kind of lives we could lead, mm -hmm. and and so it's part of what we've been trying to do is is just amplify these voices, and and knit these movements together so we're greater than the sum of our parts. Yeah. Yeah. This is a beautiful and perfect story for us to take some questions. I do have one final question which I'm going to ask at the very end, but I want to. I want to come to some questions, but before we take questions from all of you, uh, Zipporah, you mentioned that you've got one of your colleagues in the audience, Svetlana uh, Romanko. Um, she is from Stand With Ukraine, the campaign Stand With Ukraine, and from Razum We Stand, which is the organization she runs, to tell us a little bit, to expand a little bit on what you what you said. So if we could just give her yeah, the mic, please. and then we'll, we'll turn to questions. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you so much for inviting me here today, and I am 
part of fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, big community globally and in Ukraine as well. And I'm here to bring the Ukrainian uh, voice and the perspective of how we can live and win through this era of energy insecurity and uh, fossil fuel dictatorships and uh, the termination of fossil fuel like uh, industry in the prices and uh, creating more and more energy insecurity and the cost of living crisis, not even saying that right now when I am speaking, because I'm visiting many events to bring the voice, uh, when I'm speaking in my country, people are dying and those who liberate the territories on the east and the south of Ukraine, they, they found more and more mass graves. So far they are all mined, but we don't know what atrocities uh, will be undercovered when people will be able to get access to that. We have already lost many, many human lives, and of course that's a big tragedy, but at the same time we have, we have a unique chance to understand and that the fight for Ukraine's freedom may lead us to what scientists told us for many, many months and days and years to do. We have to stop burning oil, gas and coal everywhere. And this is the only way, not just only a price, oil price cap or some other artificial measures that just put onto the industry, but our only way to win and to defeat in a global scale and help Ukraine to win over Putin and uh, defeat the largest fossil fuel dictatorship in the world who attacked us just because they are our neighbors and they ha hate our independence. So that's, that's the only way how we can get to the fossil, fossil free, freedom of fossil fuels. And that's the only way how we can rebuild Ukraine. Because uh, for me, it's uh, like exactly what Treaty is saying about an uh, elephant in the room, because Paris Agreement does not contain a very clear measurable goal of how we stop climate crisis. And Treaty tries to bring this perspective into all spaces. And what we are trying to bring in every space as we come, that we have enough of fossil fuel dictatorships everywhere, in Ukraine, in the global south, and these conflicts are multiplying and mounting their, their disastrous effects on all people, and that's time for us to take over over them. And the winner takes it all, as in the song, and th that's why this fight is very important. And just to say to that, I would like also to bring the perspective of Ukrainian green recovery. And for me, as a climate activist, it's a bit too early to speak about Ukrainian green recovery. Let's end the war first, and let's just impose embargo on fossil fuels, and let's just actually endorse the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty in Ukraine and bring this momentum and sparkle this momentum onto some other countries to fight this global insecurity created by energy crisis and by climate crisis and by everything that we, we faced um, over, the, over the last almost eight months. And, um, but there are a lot of discussions right now how to rebuild Ukraine and of course we don't want dirty fossil fuel money coming out from the same big investors uh, who are sitting somewhere safely in New York or somewhere or even here in London because there are many of them here. We just want to uh, green investments tripled, as, as Treaty Report says, uh, fossil fuel exit strategy released last year, that we have enough renewable energy potential in the world and we just need to release it. So we expect uh, everyone to help us to rebuild Ukraine in green uh, after we will end the war. And it's in incredibly important that we endorse the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and phase out fossil fuels in Ukraine and globally. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'd love to see if there are any questions. We've got some mics floating around. Are there any questions? Okay, we've got one in the back. Let's take that one. Uh, let's take the two there, and then I'll come to the middle section. So we'll take two questions at a time. I've got one there, and then if you want to pass the mic as well. Hi. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, we were quite shocked coming out of um, COP26 and every other COP previously that there seems to be very little country leadership. Everything seems to be like incremental measures, and it's always a race to the bottom. And you were just saying that there was one country that has, has signed up to endorse the, the treaty. Which countries do you see as being the most potential that they're likely to sign up? What, what would you say were the next sort of three or four that might? 
So that's one question, sorry. I was also going to say, how many do you need to sign up so you get to a point where, that, where you said earlier that you could actually start like, forming an actual treaty? And three, when they do sign up, how do you make sure they actually stick with, you know, how do you enforce that they do something and they don't just say, yeah, all right, I'm going to come to the party, but I'm going to stand on the side and not do much? I'm going to take one more question before we do that, if we just pass the mic over here. Thank you. Hi, uh, Rebecca Shirley from the World Resources Institute. Fantastic um, conversation. Um, uh, Sephora, you mentioned something about that was quite interesting to me. You said that um, part of the proliferation is sort of coming up against this uh, idea of um, constantly needing production and growth. And I'm wondering if there is an embedded new economic order um, that's embedded in the treaty and what you think that new economic order should look like. Because we're kind of coming up against what is the elephant in the room, right? That, that, that yeah, you get me. <laughs> okay, let's start with some, some numbers and some wish list countries for, for you. Sure, um, we are now in conversation uh, with a number of other countries in the Pacific Island nations and Vanuatu is really taking uh, the lead in starting to have those conversations. So. Uh, we fully expect that we're going to see more countries uh, from Pacific Islands. And that is important because these are the countries that are most vulnerable and traditional and, and, and in fact have been leaders on a number of other critical concepts globally, loss and damage, et cetera, you know, they have, uh, from the Pacific Islands. So that's important. Out of the blue, um, right after uh, Vanuatu endorsed the Minister of Climate Change for New Zealand, um, uh, started tweeting about how he thinks the fossil fuel treaty, uh, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is brilliant and countries from around the world should step up. So that has led us to an interesting conversation with New Zealand that um, they haven't endorsed yet, but that's interesting. Um, the following day after, Ven after Vanuatu, the president of East Timor, who is a Nobel laureate himself and who had endorsed the treaty, stood up in the UN General Assembly and started his speech by talking about how the, important the fossil fuel treaty is. Um, we have, we're starting to have conversations with a number of countries in Latin America who have new uh, governments who are, quite, who are talking about ending fossil fuel expansion. You can imagine who those are. Um, and we are already in conversations with a number of countries in Europe as well. <clears throat> um, and I would say one of the most exciting and hopeful things we saw at, Co at COP26 um, that is now growing, and I'm fascinated to see how fast it will grow at COP27, is the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. And I see Kata Bro here in the audience, who was one of the people who, global leaders that proposed BOGA even before countries like Denmark and Costa Rica took it on. So this is an alliance of first movers, led initially last year by Denmark and Costa Rica, now, um, now uh, uh, 10, 11 other jurisdictions, 14, 14 jurisdictions have joined on to, to, to BOGA, and they have said um, no new expansion of oil and gas. So to have these, so they haven't endorsed treaty yet, um, but they, they have started to create a kind of like powering past coal, like a peer-based network to, to, to push the issues, and they put on an incredibly strong statement last week in response to this question of energy security and fossil fuel expansion. So I'm pretty excited to see those countries starting to organize themselves and take on the conversation themselves. And if people want more information about BOGA, I think um, Kat knows a hell of a lot more than I do, and she's here, so that's exciting. So to, thank you. So to the second question, and question around a new economic order and whether that's embedded in, in, in the treaty, I'm wondering if, Brian, you might want to take this one? Well, I, I'll kind of answer it a little bit obliquely. I can start the answer. But what, what, you, what we now know is that the fossil fuel-based energy system is deeply inefficient, like on every level. And e even financially, actually, they take a lot of bets that don't pay off. And that's but because they're an oligopoly. They price fix to allow them to take these risks. So it's, it's a bit of a shaky foundation. And when you shift to essentially what's going to be largely an electric-based system, you save up to two-thirds of the primary energy that you're using when you're using an oil and gas and coal-based system. And the reason for that is that generate, moving electrons around using all sorts of different cabling and certainly the high-voltage direct current cabling means you can move electrons around really efficiently and you don't have the heat losses you get from burning things. Like, burning things is deeply inefficient. We've been doing it for centuries and we can move beyond this into an electric future and th that means that essentially you could have the same level of comfort or work uh, you know that th from a third of the primary energy 
So that means solar, wind, nuclear, geothermal, hydro, wave, you name it. All these ways we've got of moving electrons around directly to provide us with transport and heat and chemicals even, and uh, electricity to power our systems is so much more efficient that the fossil industry is gonna struggle. And it's already struggling because these ways of generating electricity are so prolific and now so cheap that they really can't compete. On Just on thermodynamics alone, they're going to lose. So we shouldn't be feeling like, oh gosh, we, we're in the thrall of this industry. It provides us with all our needs. It doesn't. It, or it does at a high cost, not just economically, but socially and environmentally. So that shift to a manufactured electricity-based system is happening. There's nothing much they can do to put the genie back in the bottle. So they're going to delay and delay and delay. And you'll hear a lot about hydrogen as the solution or carbon capture and storage. And these are the last vestiges. And I'm sorry, Gabrielle, because I know you do a lot on this. But you know, these are the last vestiges of an industry that knows it's shrinking. And it will still provide a service through those technologies. But it won't be the trillions of dollars worth of capital that they have now at work. So, so, there, so that new energy system is coming. And yes. Some of them will pivot and play a role in the future if they can get the technology right and at cost. But right now, it's looking pretty bleak. Okay, can, so I, well, yeah. Yeah, can I just add, um, what we're essentially proposing is that the global north and the global south agree on the terms and conditions for a global just transition. And, and that, is, that is a new global social contract. So yes, it, 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 it is a new economic world order in a lot of ways, right? Like that, that is essentially what we are saying. So how does that happen? How does that relate to existing trade agreements? How does that relate to issues of liability and compensation? These are huge questions that we have to have the conversation for, and we're not. And that's part of the goal of the treaty, is to create those conversations. So for example, at, at the University of Westminster earlier this week, um, or was that last week? That was last week. Um, we, we convened lawyers, international lawyers and diplomats and economists to answer that question, to start looking at, can it be binding? If it is binding, what is the relationship to trade agreements? And, and how does that work? And, and so I, we're not claiming to have all the answers. We're trying to create a proposal that creates the right conversations at the scale of solutions that we need that are based on fairness and equity. Paul, was there anything you wanted to add there? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've written a book called Post-Capitalism, so, uh, which to my surprise became a bestseller. And I think the reason it, it did so was because in it I argued for a gradual transition to a, leaving aside the carbon issue, to a more collaborative, less profit-centered uh, and less privately owned economy. But I do not want anything like that written into a global treaty because I think that... We, the, the, the system that achieves zero net carbon by 2050 or before will be a capitalist system. And it just has to be one in, in which, as you, you say, we've moved significantly away from fossil, not just fossil fuel energy systems, but fossil-based ways of life. And that achieving that alone will be the job of nation states and, in other words, democracies who will impose that on their government. I think the, the treaty is just one part of a framework, you know, Paris itself is another part of that framework. The achievements that we've already uh, achieved in, in the finance sector, in, in, the, in the energy sector, the creation of a renewable sector has been an achievement of global capitalism. So I don't want things, for example, like degrowth written into a treaty. I just want a new economic framework that just basically says no more fossil. As you say, non-proliferation uh, as a step would be a brilliant step. So, Paul, well, I, I think I hear you endorsing the concept of the treaty, and I did check <laughs> online. I did check online this morning, and I and I didn't see um, your name as uh, as one of the endorsers. So I just wanted to well, see. I, I very happily. I might, I might just give you the opportunity I, I very, to. Um, I very very happily I sign this. I have a pen, this. you know, but, and then just. I, I'll just say I very happily sign this, but the real, <laughs> the, the, and I've done it. I've done it. And, <laughs> but. but the, the two words I want to I want to see on the treaty are Charles Windsor. I can't help myself. I'm a campaigner at heart, you know. <laughs> oh wait, we had some more questions. We got one here, Gabriella, um, and then we'll take one in the back as well. Thanks. Uh, this this is doing me so much good. Thank you, guys. Honestly, this you spend so much of your life feeling like you're banging your head against a brick wall, and then every so often you find yourself in, in a group of people, you just think, oh, I'm among my people. 
So thank you. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, we can talk later about the CCS stuff, right? And uh, the comment I make about, about the electrification part is that um, uh, if that could do everything, I'd be all for it, and it can't do everything. And, and it's just kind of escaping from the notion that there's kind of one big solution that, that does everything. Um, but what I want to ask you, Seth, is that when you first told me about the treaty, and this really, I remember it very vividly in, back in 2019, and, and what you told me was about conversations with the Canadian government where you said, you, you mentioned it, where you said something about them being the, 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 the want to be, everyone wants to be the last barrel standing. And what you said was, they said, if we don't produce it, when the demand's there, someone else will. And we'll do a better job of it, and we'll use the money to do something better. And I just wanted you to comment on that. It's, it's, there's also there was a hero narrative here as well, which is that it, it's not, and, and, and which allows governments to feel like they're genuinely doing the right thing for themselves and their own country and their own people. And if they don't do it, they'll forego the economic money, the, the economic benefit for the for, for the Canadians. Meanwhile, the Saudis are going to do it instead, and, and, and then we don't trust them. And so, so it's just that narrative. And one of the things that enchanted me about this treaty is the way. It Goes straight to the heart of that, and then the other question. So it's just, can you comment on that? As, as, as this as a route to, to almost give them like air cover, and, and then uh, and I'll give them a different narrative. This is how you can do the right thing for your people, and not just for the world, um, and which kind of rhymes with that. Uh, do it for self-interest, and not just for, for virtue. And then the other thing was, um, is I completely, as you know, how, you know how much I endorse this and, and completely support that we've been focusing on demand and not supply. Um, I just want to, to get a comment on how those two things nonetheless still go hand in hand as you're bigging up the what do we do about supply? How can you make sure that that does continue to go hand in hand? And those are two kind of aspects of the same question. Great. I'm going to take one more in the back there, I think. You've got the mic. Is it working? I think that one's working. Um, okay, great. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So I have a two-part question on just transition. Um, number one, we heard that recently UK restarted their coal plants in light of increasing gas prices, right? And the idea is to be able to provide access and affordability for the communities and people. So I would love to hear some of your thoughts on that uh, in terms of do you think that was the right move or is there a better way to tackle that problem? Could government have done something differently? And my second part of the question is we alluded a little bit to how we might eventually race to an unjust transition because we are backed up against time, right? And I feel like we had a lot of conversation about how to ensure just transition uh, when we shut down coal plants. But now we are hearing a lot of reports about renewable energy uh, plants and uh, other things opening up, which are actually violating human rights as well of indigenous people, like in the silicon fields, et cetera. So how do we think about just transition in terms of the renewable uh, energy? Great, thank you for those questions. Okay, let's start with this idea of a different narrative? Um, so so the, this question of um, constraining supply is not a climate issue, which is in fact what a lot of people from the federal government in Canada told me when I first started working on this. You know, someone else will just, you know, leakage, leakage, competitiveness, someone else will just produce it. Um, first of all, that is not actually the way the market is working now, um, and that's really interesting. The newest research by the Stockholm Environment Institute, digging into particular regions, looking at regions that have banned fracking or that have taken supply side policy action, um, it is, uh, it, it's not just an issue where it's a waterbed issue and, it, and, and, and it's being created somewhere else. And that's, a, there's complicated reasons for that that we can't get into today, but I would say look at the work of Pete Erickson, it's totally fascinating. And in the last IPCC report, there was a whole fascinating section on how supply and lock-in of greater fossil fuel expansion is impacting demand, which kind of puts that on its head. And that, again, is really, really uh, n new thinking. Um, but what, what I love about, talk about the fossil fuel treaty is when you start talking to governments about that, 
um, and especially the public. Our public polling in California showed that 82%, even, in, even Republicans, support the idea of the fossil fuel treaty because then it would be fair that, that you know, they, 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 it doesn't work for one jurisdiction or one country to say, all oh, right, well, we won't do it, but then someone else gets to. And so everybody realizes that we need to constrain expansion, but no one wants to do it. It's, it's the Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons, you know? And, and so people, when you start talking to countries and even the public in a lot of country about, well, actually, it's not fair, you're right. And that's why everybody needs to stop expansion. And we need to figure out how to do that. And then they're like, oh yeah, okay. And, and so it really is just, it's totally shifting because it, People are respond to questions of fairness, right? And that's and that's what they want to see in order to be willing to take action. Brandy, can I come to you around the question of the supply and demand scissors? How do these things go together? Yeah, and I, I can pick up the question about the the, the coal one as well. Um, I, I, essentially, we, I mean, the, you, you, you answered your own question, Gabrielle, because you know the, the narrative is this hero narrative. But what you need to do is find champions within governments who can then band together and then use something extra beyond their own national conversation to force action. So we used to have the European Union for this. We'd go off to Brussels and say, "Oh, I'm awfully sorry, we've had to sign up to this treaty." And blah, blah. you know, that that is a, a function of how environment ministers or progressives within governments force change by banding together and, and working at a higher level and coming back and selling it at home. And that's what we need here, because every economic minister who's studied Chicago School Economics is going to be coming back saying, well, it makes absolutely no sense for us to not license and extract every single last jot of oil out of the North Sea. When it, Obviously, that's a suicide mission if every country thinks that way. <laughs> so somebody has to break that narrative and be the hero and, and use moral argument to say, we, we've got to do this. And actually then, once you've got a band of you all together and you're working through the UN, it's much easier. So I mean, that's, the, that's the beauty of it, really, isn't it? That you, you appeal to this moral question, which you can get to when you're above the nation state. Um, but on the question of the coal, and yeah, I mean, why is the UK bringing back coal? Um, I mean, it, it, we are facing extraordinary circumstances this winter, and, and it's a deeply uncertain few months we're about to pass through, and probably another year where we have artificially constrained the market in Europe for gas. And it, it takes time for us to find alternatives. Like, you can insulate your home pretty fast, but we still, most people are still going to want to turn on their gas boiler and, and have it fire up. So what might happen this winter is we will stop using gas in power stations in order for people to still be able to heat their homes. In which case, that will trigger an emergency and, and these coal stations will be brought back on. Because there is the possibility that we have a very cold and very still, not very windy winter. If we have that, all bets are off. I mean, it starts to get, I would be thinking yourselves about how you make sure your homes are, are warm as they can be. It's, this is, and everyone in the industry is saying this. So this is not trivial. So in those circumstances, the bringing back of a few coal-fired power stations in reserve so that they can be there if we need them is entirely sensible. And, and I fully endorse that for a short period, right? These stations are not being built anew. These are all stations that are being brought back for this particular purpose. We will not get any progress if people blame environmentalists for the winter we're about to have. So we have to be alive to that. And we will be, hopefully, generating a huge amount of power from wind, right? But you can't, unfortunately, be completely sure. It's very likely that we will. But you've got to be, as a government and as a market, understanding that this may go, not go our way. We may throw a one and not a six. And that's, that's where we're at right now. So I, I don't think it's a signal of long-term return back to fossil, but there's, we've got to get through this winter. Yeah, but using this moment, I, I, I don't disagree, but using this moment to, to, to fear-monger about price and then therefore saying that the solution to the price increases and the security is to lift the ban on fracking and do 130 oh, yeah, no, more oil drilling, like, that's, that's absurd. Yeah. Like, yeah. that, that, those are long-term infrastructure plays that will not... Uh, help energy security issues uh, now, um, and they won't help price either. It, no. so. it seems to me that it's about not lumping everything in together, so that a few coal plants that have existed being in backup are different than new fossil fuel infrastructure that won't be online in time. Um, well, I wanted to ask you about, just to pick up on that last question around is there a better way for us to tackle this cost of living and this energy crisis here in the UK? Well, um, 
just to come back to the question of the treaty, um, there's an interesting parallel with the 30s. Obviously, the climate problem wasn't the problem in the 30s, although it existed. Um, but in the 1930s, the global order fell apart. You know, the League of Nations became a dead letter um, as you know, Germany invaded, Italy invaded Ethiopia, etc. And the tradition I come from, the labor tradition, has a, a, has a kind of quite pro record on this because Clement Attlee, who became you know, Prime Minister in 1945, entered government in 1940, was a pacifist, was a profound believer, as were many British people, 11 million British people signed up to support the League of Nations and peace. And they saw their dream fall apart. In other words, in international relations terms, they were idealists and the ideals fell apart. As they went into the Second World War, Attlee and that tradition said, okay, we're gonna have to not have peace, we're gonna have to have armies, but, from the moment we begin this, we're going to design the new world. And Attlee went into the Second World War saying, at the end of it, there's going to be a United Nations. There's going to be a treaty-based order. Now, I think we're going to see a very tough winter, maybe two winters. The global order will look much worse for a, a time. But what I would argue, and what I would urge you to take away, is that we have to be idealists in a realist world. That is, no matter how much it falls apart, our goal has to be treaty, law, and agreement. We've already got Paris, we, we can have this. I think you're very optimistic, and rightly so, about how, how quickly it could become a thing. And that one of the reasons it become a thing is as we go through the, the really horrible period that we're about to do in international relations, we can see a goal. If we can't see a goal, the, the, whole, thing, the whole thing will fall apart. And I think translating that into that domestic politics, we've done our best inside the Labour Party, two conferences in a row, the lead offer has been a green offer, despite the fact our one, one obsession is to win the votes of people who don't necessarily see the value of this in the so-called red wall. Um, we still have to wean ourselves off, off uh, chimeric non-solutions. Um, I fronted a, a labor proposed thing into COP26 about, about hydrogen, okay? Um, green good, blue bad, but there's a lot of people still in a kind of productivist mindset, still thinking about that and not thinking hard enough about let's impose a new order on ourselves through international law. Okay, so unfortunately we have run out of time for questions. I want to, I know, I want to just end and before I give you 30 seconds to leave us with the conversation you want us to have when we come back and talk again in 24 months. Like what will we, we be talking about? Um, I, well, I hope um, uh, that we're going to be talking about the new proposals that have emerged from the right conversation. You know, the, this is, uh, you know, sometimes we get pushback. A treat, new treaty will take too long, it's, you know, too big, etc. Um, you know, well, first of all, if you look at landmines, chemical weapons, nuclear, um, some of those from the point that the conversation started happening, the first country proposed, were two years. Um, and, and, and this, what I think it's important to remember when you look at all of those and with the treaty is that the journey matters. This conversation that we've had here today is changed some of the thinking of the people in this room. I guarantee it because that's what we're seeing in the conversations of treaty all over the world. Because we haven't before be talked about how do we constrain production? How do we pull that power away from the oil and gas industry? How do we not? How do we start to regulate them in a way that has fairness and equity at its core? So the journey matters. The conversation matters. I hope we have new proposals on the floor of what what it looks like uh, to actually implement a new treaty in in 24 months. And 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 to those who say it can't be done, I I want to end with this. It is a big and bold new idea. But at this moment in history, we cannot afford more of the same. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming and for spending your morning with us. Thank you to The Conduit for hosting and thank you to all of our panel.